So I'm here as the uh, person to represent infectious diseases and microbiology, just to remind you that genomics is not all about human genetics. Interesting though it is, I'm going to try and convince you that infectious diseases are, are even uh, as interesting or even more interesting maybe than human genetics. Some thumbs up in the audience, that's great. Um, and rather than um, try and give you a, a lot of didactic slides, I'm going to try and tell you a story. And in telling that story, hopefully um, get across over some, some concepts about um, how genomics um, is transforming and, and will continue to transform um, the practice of uh, infectious disease diagnostics, uh, epidemiology, um, and surveillance, which are clearly important topics. The story I'm going to tell you about is this story of um, how we use uh, sequencing um, to uh, help with the epidemic response uh, in Ebola uh, uh, in West Africa um, in 2015. And um, uh, that was during an epidemic which lasted three years from the end of 2013 uh, to 2016. This is a picture um, of uh, Joe Bore, a clinical scientist in Guinea, now doing a PhD in, in the UK. Um, running um, genome sequencer for MinEye, which I'll tell you a little bit about, um, sequencing Ebola virus genomes um, um, in real time as the outbreak um, in Guinea was progressing. I'll tell you how that story uh, came to be. But before I start on that story, I'll just give you just a very brief history lesson of where we've been um, with sequencing. Um, and I'm actually. I've got a medical background, but I really am a computer person, and I think this is how I ended up as a computer person with a medical background in genomics and biology, because you couldn't get a, a more clear link between the development of the, the world of computing as, as you get with the world of sequencing and genomics. So um, back in the, the dim and distant past, 2001, um, it you know, we had the equivalent of the mainframe computer. The way we sequenced genomes was in factories, factories full of ABI instruments that use Sanger sequencing, which we heard about just now. And uh, you have literally hundreds of these machines running um, on, a, on, a, on a floor, um, being loaded, constantly loaded by usually school leavers down at the Sanger Center, um, trying to keep these instruments churning out data why? Because um, the big goal was to try and complete the human reference genome uh, faster than the uh, sort of public effort was trying to compete with the private effort led, led by Craig Venter uh, and trying to finish off the human genome. Didn't really finish it, but they kind of finished it um, um, by 2001. And it was estimated that the total cost of that genome, when you count all of the costs of the buildings and the people, something in the realm of $2.7 billion, about $100 million worth of reagents, it took 13 years. Much more interestingly, of course, bacterial genome sequencing was uh, the proof principle of human genome sequencing, and, that, and the first bacterial uh, genome sequence was completed in 1995, so a bit over 20 years ago, and that took about a million dollars in reagents, about three years to achieve. Fast forward, um, 10 years, we have the advent of so-called next generation sequencing. Very, by the way, it's a very bad term for technology, next generation sequencing, is what you call the thing that comes after next generation sequencing, you call that next next generation sequencing. But um, what we, we like to call it high throughput sequencing, and that's really exemplified by uh, the uh, Illumina platform that's also been referenced in previous talk. And then things start to get very interesting. We know how we can do human genomes for something around thousand dollars in reagent costs and take between a few days and a week. Um, and of course, for microbial genomes, microbial genomes are a fraction of the size of, of human genomes. Human genomes about three billion base pairs, typical bacterial genome between one and five million base pairs, which means that the cost of doing a genome sequence for a bacterium is much less, about fifty dollars, takes a couple of days. But now we're, we're right on the cusp of potentially a new revolution, so I'm going to talk about, which is um, talk about nanopore sequencing, that's kind of what we're going to focus on uh, for this talk because um, this is the first example of a portable sequencer. Um, literally, literally a sequencer that you can fit in your pocket. I've got one in my pocket here. Um, the only instrument, the only sequencing instrument you can throw, okay, so <laughs> 
I'll pass it around if you want. Um, there's nothing. To, there's a bit of fluid in there, but there's nothing dangerous in there. Don't worry. <laughs> no fluid. Um, I'll talk about this instrument in a bit more detail. But so that's the, the history of sequencing. Now, clinical microbiology, I would argue, is ripe for disruption because the approaches we use in a clinical microbiology lab, particularly in bacteriology, but also in virology, um, would be completely familiar to, to Louis Pasteur or Robert Koch. Nothing's really changed, really, quite a few things changed, nothing's really changed fundamentally since the 19th century. Uh, the use of culture, uh, specific culture to isolate bacteria, the use of microscopy, simple stainings uh, to identify species, all of those approaches are still um, what go on albeit in a much more automated fashion uh, in a clinical microbiology lab. But the vision that we're going to try and get over today is can we move to a digital form of microbiology involving sequencing? So rather than uh, growing organisms, we work in a culture-independent, culture-free ma manner, and we use sequencing as our standard test, our test to um, identify bacteria, to understand the relationships between uh, bacteria and viruses, um, etc. And, and we're not there yet, but, but potentially, but I think this may be why I was about to speak, is to kind of get the idea that this might be where we're going. So what, what, what's the big deal about genome sequences um, for um, infectious disease uh, diagnosis and surveillance? Why, you know, why are we so interested in genome sequences? Um, there are lots of reasons, and I've already alluded to the fact that, that we can render them into digital information. That's quite important. If you can put a genome sequence into a computer, you instantly have all the abilities uh, um, that, that being that digital information uh, uh, gives you, particularly in the internet age. And, and, and the, the key thing is the, the ability to be able to rapidly share that information between different labs producing genome data and to compare uh, the genome sequences. Now, why is it important to be able to compare genome sequences? Well, you know, everything evolves. Like all life has nucleic acid, that's important. So all life has nucleic acid, viruses uh, um, have RNA or DNA genomes, microbes, bacteria, fungi have DNA genomes. Um, and all life evolves, and uh, evolution is driven by mutations. We heard about the impact of deleterious mutations in terms of human genetics. But actually, most mutations, uh, well, actually, many mutations are deleterious, but in a, in a microbial population, uh, those are usually um, selected out, so they don't tend to, to propagate if they, if they uh, are, are disadvantageous to the organism. And then the, what the, 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 the mutations that do uh, survive in populations tend to be neutral. So effectively, what we have is we've got a form of, uh, we've got a, a, a molecular clock, we've got a form of, of dive, of uh, an engine that's generating diversity, which is what we're trying to show in this picture. The genome slowly, over time, mutates. Most of the mutations are not very interesting, but they act as a way of allowing us to define the relationships between strains. So, um, strains that share a recent common ancestor will be much more similar to strains that, 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 that have been separated in space and time. And that is important, as I will show, for uh, many things, and particularly for using genome sequences to understand outbreaks and epidemics. Um, and you know, the, the, it doesn't really matter what organism we're talking about, they all uh, evolve, but they may evolve at slightly different rates. And we're going to focus on fast evolving viruses like um, Ebola. So once we can compare uh, genomes, we can use that information for, for quite a number of different tasks. Um, and you know, specifically, we can look at identification. You know, what is something? Very famously, in the large uh, E. coli, uh, what's called the sprout break outbreak in Germany, um, um, kind of understanding that E. coli was, was confusing for, for the clinical microbiology department because it was really a hybrid of two different types of E. coli strains: sugar toxin encoding strain and what's called an interaggregative strain. It didn't really fit the common classification, but with, but with genomics, we could quite quickly from the genome put together the ancestry of that strain and its uh, virulence factors that made it uh, um, um, actually quite lethal, about 50, de 50 deaths associated with that outbreak. We can use it, and this is the most compelling argument, we can use the genomes for source tracking. Where does something come from? 
Um, you remember uh, the earthquake in Haiti um, was, was followed by a large cholera outbreak, which persists to this day. Um, there was a big debate about where that cholera had come from. Was it um, as a result of a breakdown of sanitation, but the cholera had been in Haiti all along? Wasn't the case. By comparing genome sequences from cases of cholera in Haiti with a, a global database of other cholera strains, you could see very, very clearly that those strains were very closely related to a recent uh, 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 set of cases in Nepal. And epidemiology confirmed that it was actually Nepalese UN peace but peacekeeping or, or um, uh, aid workers coming in, Brit, who actually brought cholera in to that island. Uh, a very similar approach was used to understand where uh, anthrax uh, came from during the Amerithrax um, um, and mailings of anthrax spores just after 9 11, which we thought was a, a new type form of terrorism, bioterror, but in fact uh, came from a US government worker working on anthrax um, and tracked it back to his lab. Can commit suicide. That's a very interesting story about too much of this. Um, but we, once we know where something's from, we can hopefully use the information to control the outbreak. I'll talk about that in, in more detail. And mustn't forget that the genome is an important source of new biology. We can understand about how, how organisms work from the genome. Okay, so that's, that's the background. We're going to talk about Ebola now. And what was notable about the Ebola epidemic, well, many things were notable, but one thing that was notable was this was a huge epidemic, about 30,000 uh, confirmed cases, probably more in reality, around 10,000 deaths. Ebola never been seen before in West Africa, always uh, seen confined to, to Central uh, Africa, places like uh, the DRC. And um, the epidemic curve at the bottom is measured in thousands, number of cases and, and a peak in September 2014. First case probably in December 2013, but not recognized as Ebola for about three or four months um, afterwards in March. And um, at the top is the number of genome sequences uh, that are available for the outbreak epidemic at the same time. Now you could say, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's an Ebola epidemic. We've got to focus on diagnosis and focus on molecular diagnostics and focus on treatment centers and focus on uh, um, an outbreak response. It doesn't really matter that we don't have genome sequences. But, and, and that's the reason why I'm going to try and convince you that, that that's not true, but, but um, it's not actually that we didn't have genome sequences. We did have genome sequences. But many of them were sat on people's hard drives waiting to be published um, in big flashy journals. Um, and it really reflected a lack of data sharing as much as a, a lack of genome sequences. But also, there's a massive time lag in getting these genome sequences done because, you know, think about you're in, a, in an outbreak situation, um, you know, it's, it's quite logistically difficult to get DHL to come and pick up samples at the best of times, right? But you say, I've got, you know, I've got 100 or 200 Ebola-infected blood samples I'd like to send to the UK, okay? DHL, from experience, is not that keen, okay? <laughs> They will charge you a lot of money, but also, you know, you need permissions to do this, to get the local government, local Ministry of Health to agree to let you do this. Is it, is it ethical to ship these samples out of the country? That's a, that's a debate. But, but anyway, it's quite practically difficult to do genome sequencing um, in, an, in an Ebola outbreak, just as it's practically difficult to do many things. Um, and so it seemed to us completely obvious that we, that instead of, 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 of going through this difficult, um, logistical scenario, why not provide sequencing capacity um, into the outbreak and integrate it with the diagnostic capacity? So, so many groups, um, we work with the European Mobile Labs, um, set up diagnostic mobile diagnostic laboratories for molecular diagnostics for Ebola. Why not add sequencing capacity into that? Would that genome sequencing information actually help us understand the epidemic? Um, we didn't really know if it would, but we thought it might. Um, so this is um, um, our kit, this is what we call the lab in the suitcase, this is our, um, our, our very basic setup and you can see it's not a lot of stuff. Hard case with some equipment in, things like PCR thermocycler if you've been in the lab, and a, and a fluorometer, um, some laptops, and we need some flow cells for the, for the MINI and for the sequencer and some molecular biology reagents, and that's it. That's in the, uh, that's, 
that's everything you need to get started with a, with a sequencing lab now. Um, and uh, in fact, the top bag is just uh, my PhD student's Josh's um, pants and socks. You don't actually need that for sequencing, although you know, always pack sensibly. Now, by contrast, now this is not a you know, completely novel idea. Um, so uh, at the time, someone I didn't know, Ian Goodfellow, uh, from Cambridge had the same idea. He wanted to work in Sierra Leone, we wanted to work in Guinea. And um, he wasn't really familiar with this technology because it was really quite early days for this technology. And so he, he, um, he tried to get Illumina to um, sell an instrument, but um, they weren't that keen to support this application. So he bought an iron torrent instrument, which is another benchmark next generation sequence. So this, by contrast, is the set of kit that you need to set up a mobile sequencing lab with just the, you know, two years ago, you know, the, the previous version of technology, if you like. So, so, you know, you need a truck, and you need quite a big lab, and you need, um, I think they have aircon, and uh, it's, it's a much more um, elaborate setup. So, um, Josh flew to uh, Conakry, um, the capital of, of Guinea, um, and this is a Donka Hospital, it was built by the Soviets, I think in the, in the, in the, in the 70s. Um, and um, he set up his equipment, and you can see there's not, it's a, a pretty basic uh, setup with some laptops and the sequencer that I passed around, which is the previous version of the sequencer, and the thermocycler and some, some kit. And the thing about Josh is that you haven't met him, but quite forgetful person, okay? So, we were pretty, I mean, we were quite nervous at, at this point for like lots of reasons. One was that he's going into um, a place where there's quite a lot number of cases of Ebola. The other, but I was actually more concerned that he was going to forget something. He was to come back with his tail between his legs, not with no genetics, but he didn't. Um, he managed to remember everything. And um, 48 hours later, he was able to generate the first Ebola virus genome um, in the country. Um, so, and that's really a la kind of that's a landmark achievement. Um, um, but it's also, you know, it's quite a remarkable achievement if you try to do that at home. You just set the sequencer and get some sequences two days later. It typically takes about a month to get all the bits and pieces in place. Um, so I think we can prove that we can set up these labs now much more quickly, um, even in resource-limited situations. Uh, I should just point out Mark Carroll, who is, who is um, at Public Health England and was part of the European Mobile Labs project that really facilitated this work. And Dr. Nazuma is working on the vaccine trial uh, in Conakry, which was a, developed a successful um, um, vaccine um, for Ebola towards the end of the epidemic. Okay, so quickly, how do you do this? We um, wanted to use a technique that would enrich for Ebola. We just wanted to sequence Ebola virus genomes. We didn't want to sequence any other pathogens. We didn't want to sequence human uh, genomes. So um, we developed a PCR approach, a standard approach. Um, and this is just the Ebola virus genome. It's about 20 kb long. It's a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, and what we could do is design what's called a tiling PCR scheme. It just means that you amplify the genome in sections, 11 sections, uh, each about 2 kb long and overlapping, and you sequence a pool of those amplicons from the PCR, and that gives you uh, the genome. After that, you make a, a sequencing library, and then it goes into um, the nanopore sequencer. This is an animation from the manufacturer just showing you how nanopore sequencing works. And the, the trick here, there's many tricks, but one trick is it's a single molecule sequencer. Okay, so most of the other technologies we talked about today are sequencing a population of molecules that are all the same, a clonal population. Here we're sequencing an individual <coughs> strand of DNA. We'll go back to that. Um, and um, this is achieved by some clever um, molecular techniques, um, including this blue um, um, structure, which is the nanopore itself, protein pore, just the right size to let one strand of DNA through, no more. And the, the green thing above is the motor. Uh, that controls the speed of the DNA going from um, one, uh, going from one compartment uh, to another, um, um, and uh, um, um, the idea here is you have effectively an ionic battery. You have two, comp two compartments with an ionic gradient. There is ions traveling uh, uh, from one compartment to the other. And by 
having the DNA stuck in that pore for a fixed for, for a short amount of time, this is running about 450 bases per second. You interrupt the flow of, of ions, you change the electrical current signal, and then at the bottom you can see slowed down a change in electrical current signal associated with each base going through uh, the pore. So that's in practice how it works. Um, there's a lot more detail about coming into it. But so now this is signal molecule technique, and that means that it's quite noisy. You hear people say have very high error rate. Dust has about 10% error rate. That contrasts with about a 1 to 0.1% error rate on, on a lunar platform. That's because we're looking at a single molecule. But what we're interested in for this kind of work is to call out SNPs, mutations, and this is, this is you can see here a SNP in the Ebola virus genome. We've got an A uh, um, in the middle, and you can see there's some noise associated with, with error. But you can quite clearly distinguish where there are mutations from where there aren't mutations, even with a reasonably small number of reads. And we have to have a small number of reads, we have to upload this data to, to analyze it. We have to upload it either over a 3G mobile connection or satellite phone, or as Josh kept on telling me, the hotel bar was the best place to go for this. <laughs> Um, but either way, you have to upload a small amount of data. So this represents about 500 megabytes to 1,000 megabytes or gigabyte of data, about the size of a, uh, you know, something like a, a, a film, an encoded film. Okay, so once it's on the sequence, so it's all quite quick. It takes um, an hour or something to, to sequence um, um, the genome to very high coverage, which we need to have confidence in those mutations. We upload the data. And at this point, so Josh did about 14 genomes when he was in uh, uh, Guinea, and we presented that work to the WHO and we said, what do you think? Is this interesting? Um, and our early results were just showing really that there were two distinct lineages circulating in the outbreak. And they thought that was interesting enough to commission us to continue this work in real time. So um, a whole team of volunteers kept this process going uh, to the end of the epidemic in March uh, 2016, so about a year, uh, particularly Sophie Durafor from the EM labs, and she trained uh, local clinical scientists, Joseph and Raymond, who mentioned um, uh, Lauren, and Lauren's from Public Health England, as, as is Liana um, and Antonio, and, and they were trained on, on the platform, and they ran the platform. And the idea was to sequence cases as quickly as possible. This is genuinely sequencing out in a field, okay? It's a field scenario. Um, so, all of this isn't, at the moment, this is a bit academic, but, but we know what, this is not an academic pursuit. The idea is can you use this information to change the trajectory of, of, of the outbreak and epidemic? And we knew to, to, this is only interesting if it's done quickly enough. You know? This information could be used here for epidemiology. But only if, if these cases are still relevant, the transmission chains that are, are, are still ongoing. There's no point doing this retrospectively some months or years after everything's finished. And so here we're showing, you know, we could very, very quickly analyze data a few, a few days um, from the sample being collected from the patient anywhere in Guinea to being sequenced and having a result. And the other critical thing for doing an outbreak analysis is coverage of the outbreak. Early on, we weren't getting, we were just setting out so we didn't have very good coverage, but by May, at least 50% of the cases were being sequenced. And that's critical if you're going to use the information uh, to understand transmission chains. You need good sampling of the outbreak. You can't just have a few cases that are biased. You need to have good sampling of the outbreak. Now, I, I allude to the fact that, that all life evolves and evolution is driven by mutation. Ebola is one of the faster evolving uh, genomes, we expect to see about two SNPs a month, two mutations a month um, normally. And this is what's called a root to tip. This is just showing that there is a linear relationship between the time of sampling and the distance from the root of the tree. Okay? Um, and, and the important thing is that that means that Ebola is evolving in a clock like fashion. These, these mutations are mainly neutral and they just, they, they, they pretty much can set your watch by them get about two SNPs uh, a month. And that's a lot of information when you lay it out on a tree reconstruction. <coughs> if you don't know about phylogenetic trees much, I'll, I'll walk you through this very, very quickly. But this is what happens if you compare a thousand Ebola virus genomes from this outbreak. And remember the first case was a young boy, 
uh, in forested region of Guinea, green, green, and in that case, that 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 was the that, you know there was one genome if you like. The further there was a transmission, probably from an animal population, one genome, one version of the genome. Then over two years, this represents the total amount of diversity that we see, and that's because the viruses are mutating with, uh, uh, at about two mutations a month, but they're all mutating quite randomly. So different copies, different patients over different time points will have different versions of the virus. And the idea is that um, cases that are likely to be related to each other, i.e. part of a transmission chain, should be quite similar. And cases that are unrelated, because they're separated geographically or in time, should be quite different. So that means you can immediately use this for epidemiology. And look, we have lineages, we have different subgroups. You can see that there's structure here. This is not random. You've got these lineages, and you can see, hopefully you see that these lineages are associated with geography, aren't they? Green for Guinea, uh, blue for Sierra Leone, blue, purple, red, red for Liberia. We've got, Sierra, we've got clades that associate with Sierra Leone, we've got clades that associate with Guinea, we've got clades that associate with Liberia. This is the first genome, and these are the genomes that are older. And that immediately, you can, for an epidemiologist, they can, make, they, can, they can start to say things that they couldn't say before. So let's say you're in Sierra Leone, you have a case here, case A, um, and you, you speculate that it might be related to case B. You can't get any information because no one wants to talk to, um, um, to the outbreak response because they're fearful. Um, case B looks like this. This case is not related, can't be, because they've gone off on completely different evolutionary trajectories and they share a common ancestor maybe a year ago. Okay, but case C looks very similar to case A. Are they related? Yes, they might be. Not definitely, but they might be. You can start using this to inform um, infection control practices. So, for example, uh, and sort of to illustrate the importance of data sharing, we, we, we worked in Guinea, Guinea and Goodfellow worked in Sierra Leone, we were both producing our data in real time, but critically we were sharing the information. If we hadn't shared the information, we'd know that Guinea had uh, two major lineages circulating, uh, but we wouldn't know anything about Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone's got a bunch of other lineages. If you're eagle-eyed, you might be able to see that uh, there are occasional cases in Sierra Leone that look like they might be similar to those in Guinea. If you overlay them, it's more obvious. We have some cases here, we have some cases here. Um, and these are right on the border, Sierra Leone and Guinea. There's very clear, so this is kind of clear evidence that there is repeat transmission between Sierra Leone and Guinea. Not politically, actually, what was wanted to be, what people wanted to think about at the time, but the effect of movement between countries and between places is quite significant. And this gives you an independent source of information to prove that. So critically, this information was generated, you know, within a few days of the sequence of the patient uh, being made uh, being diagnosed. We did the sequencing of bioinformatics, but then that information is given over to an epidemiologist, example, um, Amy, and we relate it so that the epidemiology investigation is going on, case you know, contact tracing, um, but it's being linked to the, phy the phylogenies that are being produced in real time. And we think that this is a model for how all outbreaks should be at epidemics. This made it into the WHO uh, situation reports, and weekly situation reports, and the genome information started to be, to be um, adopted. So here's an example from SIPREP in October. Um, it was a case, 45, 35-year-old woman, who was not a registered contact, so wasn't known to have, have come into contact with Ebola, um, was identified as being Ebola positive after death. Um, so no real information about, about what chain of transmission um, this patient belonged to, but uh, in this case we can quite clearly show it was part of a known transmission chain in, in, in Rotoma. So, um, this is talking about these cases down here in red, so this is a uh, case in Fora Carrier, and um, we can see that they, uh, they, they cluster with these green cases, um, which from the Rotoma uh, region, and we can say, you know, we can actually say, well, this is not a transmission chain that's been missed. It's part of a transmission chain. It's obviously linked between this person and the cases 
um, that, we, that we need to have to read. And that provides reassurance, it also allows you to focus um, um, resources. Sometimes we'd see cases which are not obviously linked to any uh, um, unknown case. And um, um, there's a reason for that, which I'll talk about very briefly. I'm kind of running out of time. So, so the Ebola outbreak looked like it was over uh, by about October 2016. Uh, and um, six months later, um, there, was a new, there was a new set of cases. Um, and I told you that we can use genome sequencing to discover biology. Here's an example of discovering some biology. Um, here, we, we had a, a flare-up of cases, all from, uh, from March and April. And uh, these occurred in the Nazarokori region um, of Guinea. And uh, these cases were all related, so we kind of expected a new, a new cluster of cases, all looked genetically identical or, or had one mutation different. That implies one mutation different here, difference here. Um, and the closest related case, when we related it to our database, which was now has 1,600 genomes, about 5% of total cases, uh, was from a case back in 2014, end of 2014. How's that possible? Um, you say, well, this is the closest related case that we can find. I say, well, that's very interesting because the epidemiologists have determined uh, that, uh, um, in fact, it's from the same from the same um, village, from the same family. And on testing of this person, this survivor, um, they have very strong uh, positive Ebola virus um, assay uh, in their seminal fluid. So this is an example of a, of a patient uh, we think transmitting Ebola 500 days after their initial infection, much longer than anyone expected um, Ebola could survive and be transmissible for uh, in a survivor. So we learned something about the dynamics of Ebola virus disease here that was not known before. And that's, and, and really without the genome data, we couldn't be sure about that. We have epidemiological evidence, but we couldn't really prove that it wasn't just a, uh, an ongoing chain of transmission that had been missed in that area. With this, we can really say um, 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 with quite a lot of certainty. Okay, I'm going to finish now, but I'm just going to show this video for me, which is not made by me, but made from our, from our deep genome data and other people's genome data by Andrew Rambo and Kittis Dudas, shows the information you can get just from genome sequences, time of sampling, place of sampling. <coughs> Should be clear is that there are some really quite large scale, long distance transmission events occurring here um, from, from fo foci in, in urban centres um, in three affected, mainly affected countries, uh, out to quite distant prefectures. And this sort of gives a, a new view on the epidemic. Think of it as one big homogenous outbreak, think about it as multiple outbreaks, and think about it as, as repeat. Re you know, um, sparking at new flares or kind of uh, 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 these, these transmission events over large distances, either setting up new smaller outbreaks or, or just rapidly uh, dying out. And that sort of disease dynamics uh, were not well understood um, at the time, but it gives us a, a kind of independent, unbiased way of understanding um, the outbreak and understanding the best uh, ways of, of addressing uh, the infection control. Uh, priorities. Uh, it's quite a striking video. Okay, so just to summarize, we can do this. We can do this in Africa. Um, we've done it also in Brazil uh, um, for to look at Zika uh, very quickly. We can use uh, this information to understand transmission much better, and also the role of um, zoonotic reservoirs and, and long-term chronic um, infection. And you know, luckily or unluckily, depending how you look at it, there's no shortage of diseases that we can uh, we can look at emerging infectious diseases. Um, and in addition to this quite scary list of, of nasties that could be coming uh, um, uh, at any time or, or, or already a problem, um, we need to think about antibiotic resistance as well. 
you think about antibiotic resistance exactly the same way as this, but in terms of flow of genes, genes you often on plasmids, so think about a lot of antibiotic resistance as an outbreak of plasmids moving around the hospital, moving around the community, moving between food animals <laughs> and consumers. And think about maybe using this sort of approach in real time to map that process out and to try and um, put interventions uh, to stop the spread of antibiotic resistance. We, we think that this kind of real-time analysis could work um, in the NHS, could work uh, for understanding uh, transmission in hospitals. Um, but that's not something that happens at the moment a great deal, respectively, as there are, there are uh, some groups um, uh, that, that have worked on it or are working on it at the moment. I should mention that genome sequencing is integrated into public health response, though, here, particularly for foodborne bacterial pathogens, Salmonella, E. coli, Listeria, um, um, PHE um, yeah, have been sequencing all, all those cases um, for a couple of years now um, to look for uh, clusters um, that might be associated with outbreaks. And a Birmingham success story this year is the uh, bringing um, whole genome sequencing of tuberculosis isolates online for prediction of antimicrobial resistance and for uh, detection and investigation of clusters. So it is happening in the public health um, sphere. Lots of challenges, um, clearly, but one of the reasons I'm here today is to try and you know, think about this issue, about how we integrate this information into public health response, means bringing along uh, infection control nurses, bringing along um, epidemiologists, um, um, and, and trying also to link this to other um, um, important areas, such as animal health and, and, and agriculture. Um, and uh, there is obviously a sort of always a plea that we need some money thrown in this, so who's got any money to throw something? Okay, just to finish up, so um, hopefully that was sort of <coughs> supposed to be kind of inspiring. Some other inspirational images for you, uh, uh, a group run by Arwen Edwards, um, taking nanopore sequencing up to, to Svalbard, up to 78 degrees north, and doing metagenomic sequencing on the uh, permafrost um, up there with their portable lab. Um, and this is perhaps the ultimate portable sequencing application, which is uh, Kate Rubitz, and, um, who's in the, went to the, the ISS um, astronaut, um, and sequenced um, um, uh, E. coli, uh, mouse mitochondrion, and a bacteriophage on the ISS um, uh, last year. Um, and we've actually looked at this image in quite a lot of detail, I'm kind of interested in, in the nerdy details, but just to check the veracity of this, it's not like the moon landings, it's actually happened. <laughs> it did sequence, uh, uh, um, 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 it did sequence genomes in space. So um, the frontiers are, are very exciting. I hope that um, it is something you think about in terms of, of, your, of your interest, whether that's human genetics or infectious disease, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Stunned in silence. Oh, we're going to go for this one. No, she was just having a stretch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no question. So, I, I, I think I've got a question, but it's more, more a point, which yeah. is so I've had to go and give talk to people with infectious diseases about the 100,000 Genomes Project as well. What continues to strike me is the parallel challenges in this space about data sharing. Uh, about how we deal with the information, how we transmit the information, and actually how we make it acceptable that sharing that information is appropriate because it helps everybody, including the individuals as well. So I just wanted to sort of emphasize to people here the, the parallel challenges and actually that both the infectious diseases and the humans are sort of feeding each, off each other in terms of principles of driving this forward in implementation, which is quite exciting. Yeah, I think that means there's no point doing this genome sequencing unless we can share the information. You know, the, the, the simple example was Guinea and Sierra Leone. But you know, all of these, these, these genomes are, are on their own individually are worthless and are only interesting when they're compared. And the more we have, the more resolution, more accuracy um, we have in terms of source tracking and pinpointing and understanding population biology. And it's, it's vital. And it's quite difficult in outbreaks because um, often information um, 
is sensitive um, and uh, people are worried about the reputational risk to say their country from, from releasing information. Um, we're trying to build systems to allow this to happen on a more routine basis and, and part, of, part of those systems um, incorporate new ways of, of, of data sharing. So, so you know, uh, uh, de-anonymized um, uh, metadata, places where we can put data up um, with different kind of embargo periods and, and, and try and try and have a system where it, it's completely built into the sequencing um, test to, to have a data sharing a component, but also to try and uh, reduce the risk from people that are sharing information. It, it's quite nuanced, but, but you know, actually with the Ebola response, there was no issue with us putting our data online um, within a week or two of, of um, generating it after the WHO and the stakeholders had, had seen it and understood it. Um, but there was some sensitivity over the survivor case because there was a sense that um, that, that would be an identifiable person. So there was, there was a longer uh, period and we couldn't specifically ask permission to release the data from, from, from that family. Uh, not a microphone, just please bear with me. Uh, uh, do you have any thoughts on why the Ebola virus mutates with such regularity? And, and also, um, what mechanism the, there could be for that? And, and thirdly, why are there such differences between mutation rates and different species? Yeah, so there, there's two different, there's, there's two different um, kind of parameters to understand. One is the, the mutation rate. Right? So how often is a mistake made during um, copying of the genome? Um, and really, the mutation rate is determined by how much, for example, proofreading ability um, polymerases have. You know, so so when you make cop when you make copies, is it likely to make errors um, or not? Single-stranded RNA viruses um, don't have that much in the way of, of proofreading ability, and they make mistakes um, often. Um, and then the other thing is thinking about the, the, the size of the population. You know, in an Ebola infection, you have a very large number of viral particles. Um, generated and then each time there's a transmission from patient to patient it goes through some sort of bottleneck so essentially make a random sampling of that population and that makes the new the new virus in person so it's the dynamic of the number of virus particles and the mode of transmission uh, combined with that yeah. like mutation rate um, that defines this, this evolutionary rate which is on average how many mutations do we observe when we sequence uh, genomes and yeah it, it comes out um, at a fairly fixed rate. Now, what I didn't tell you, and I should have done, is is that's not fixed for an organism. It's fixed maybe for a lifestyle. So, in our survivor, um, our survivor that had Ebola uh, in their system uh, for for nearly a couple of years, um, the evolutionary rate observed in that survivor is about a fifth of the normal evolutionary rate. Okay, so it, it's actually evolving much more slowly, and that's because we think. It's not turning over nearly as quickly um, in a patient that has some immunity to that virus. So maybe it's being quiescent for, for a time and then replicating slowly, or, or maybe it's just it's just turning over um, extremely slowly. So so you can see heterogeneity in uh, in evolutionary rates even in the same organism. Things like bacteria um, are, have mu are much better at, um, at, at um, maintaining the integrity. Um, of the genome, you see it, um, a slower evolutionary rate. You know, typical bacterial, you might see a few mutations um, a year, maybe maybe four or five mutations a year. So slow. Have you managed to look at the frequency of the different plates and see whether the mutations affect the frequency? Yeah, um, not us, but um, on this tree. So, something seems to have happened here. Okay, we've got this clay that it's maintained in Guinea, but something seems to have happened here. We've got a huge, you know, a, a number of cases um, have share a common ancestor um, um, with, with, the, with this sequence. And there is a mutation there um, that, um, that in animal models has been suggested to, to increase virulence. We have to be really cautious about interpreting this because it could just be an epidemiological phenomenon as well. It could be uh, so, for example, unsafe burial uh, practices were a large contributor to, to Ebola uh, spread, and this this could just be associated with, um, uh, say, a large a large a large funeral. Uh, but yeah, it, it's tempting to look at, uh, at, at places that look interesting in the phylogeny, 
look at mutations that um, that might change, uh, that, that that might uh, uh, that induce an amino acid change, and say, well, are they interesting? And certainly, these are candidates to go and test in the lab. But we're not very good at really putting it together and saying that's definitely the reason or not. But in animal models, something happens. Thank you. Um, particularly in the context of the Ebola outbreak and the, the resistance um, from the communities to engage with some of the healthcare professionals, once you got to the point where you were doing this kind of testing in real time and able to establish links that perhaps people weren't disclosing, did it give any practical feedback into your outbreak management? Um, yes and no. I think I think there was a sense that you know you're in, you're in a very information poor environment and you have a limited number of epidemiologists um, and epidemiologists find it hard. Some communities were much harder to access um, than, than others and, and so I think that the most compelling um, kind of use of, of this data along those lines is, is prioritization of, of where you're going to look at. So for example there was, um, there was a, a number of cases in quite a far Flung Prefecture, Boko Prefecture, right on the uh, north of Guinea, on the border of Guinea and Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau didn't have any Ebola cases, but the real worry that that's it's an even poorer uh, country than Guinea, uh, and, and, and really a big worry if it ended up there. And there was a real question about they couldn't really access that community easily to to understand if there were had been cases prolonged um, transmission in that area. Um, and they couldn't really get that information. The genome data showed quite clearly that. The, the, the new cases there shared a recent common ancestor with cases in Conakry, and that was eventually confirmed as being uh, an individual that travelled in a, in a uh, who was a burial worker who travelled in a taxi um, up 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 to up to Bokeh, taxi driver also got sick, um, and so it's more about saying that we don't think that there's a, um, a large scale missed transmission chain in this area that we need to um, make extra efforts to to, to deal with. So I think it's about resource allocation um, is the primary reason.